Hi folks, Pastor Charles here in Dallas. Oh, I just thought I'd kind of share this with you for a minute today. Uh, Mondays are always hard on me. And in, in all honesty, uh, even years ago when I was quite young, Mondays were always kind of my day off because after church on Sunday, and of course years ago we used to do two services on Sunday. I had a um, Sunday school morning service, and then I had an evening service. Uh, so I'd be quite tired after doing all that on Sunday. And uh, But these days, we're t- right now, we're just doing the one service at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And I'm still kind of wiped out when When the service is over, I take the video from our uh, HD video camera that we have at the church, and I take the video and I upload it to our laptop at the house, and then I have to edit the video and get it ready to post on YouTube, and we have five different video channels. We have a YouTube channel in the church name. We have a YouTube channel in, under my name, my personal channel. Um, we have uh, a channel on Daily Motion, another website similar to YouTube. We have a channel on uh, Vimeo for those of you that use Vimeo. And then we have one also on uh, GodTube, which is a mainstream Christian video think kind of like YouTube, but a Christian version. And believe it or not, so far, we've been there for a number of years now, and they hadn't kicked us off. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of surprised, to be honest. But anyway, we've got a channel there as well. And uh, after the Sunday service is over, I uh, take the video. Tommy and I have to eat. We eat. I come back home. And uh, I then devote about, oh Lord, anywhere from five or six hours to editing the video, getting it ready to post to our various web channels. I then uh, publish it to the computer, has to publish to the computer, you know, the software we use. You have to publish it to the computer first. And then... um, you're able to upload it to YouTube and what have you. Well, when you publish it to the computer, it takes um, not quite real time, you know, like if the video that I've edited and I've got it down to about an hour, I try to edit them for time down to about an hour um, if I go a little long, which I hate to do, but, you know, these days I'm getting old. I seem to go long more often than I wish to. And uh, But I edit the video, like sometimes I'll cut off the last few minutes of the message. I'll try to find a good spot where it can end, you know, without hurting the message at all. And um, I edit the video, and then I publish it to my computer. That takes, you know, roughly like 45 minutes or so. Then once it's published to the computer, I, I upload it to our church channel on YouTube. And that takes a while. Then once it uploads to the church channel on YouTube, you have to wait for it to process. YouTube has this processing time that it takes. And once it fully processes and you're able to view it on our YouTube channel in full HD, the 10, I think it's 1080 or whatever it is. um, Then I have a program on our computer that allows me to download it from YouTube, and it com- it makes the file much, much smaller. So if I upload it to our church YouTube channel, and I upload, let's say, a three gigabyte file, I'm able to download it with this software, and it'll download at like maybe, uh, five or 600 megabytes, so it cuts it you know, down to about 20% of the original. 
And so that makes for a much smaller file, but it's still in full HD. And uh, once I'm able to do that, I download the file, which takes a while. And I also download an audio version uh, because the same program I use that downloads the, uh, the video from YouTube, I can also just download an MP3 so I have the audio only from the message, and I do that as well. Then I upload the smaller files so it'll take a lot less time to our second YouTube channel, to our Daily Motion channel, to our Vimeo channel, and uh, our GodTube channel. And we have a channel on a, a thing called Spreaker, which is a uh, radio, um, internet radio, and that's audio only. So what I do now is I take the audio file that I downloaded using this program that I use from our YouTube and I upload the audio file to our Spreaker channel. So every sermon that I've preached for the last, I don't know how many years, is available in audio on Spreaker. And the wonderful thing about Spreaker is that you're able uh, to listen to the messages. You know, you don't have to see my chubby, ugly face. You can just listen to the message. You also can download it so people that have like MP3 players and stuff like that, you can actually download the MP3 file from Spreaker so you can listen to it while you're jogging or whatever you might be doing. So anyway, that is what I do on Sunday. So by the time I'm done preaching on Sunday, my work has just begun. I, I'm nowhere near done for the day. So by Monday, I'm quite tired. Well, today I uh, woke up this morning and um, I've got a thyroid medication, not to be real personal, but you know me, I uh, what have I got to hide? I have a thyroid medication that I take first thing in the morning. I have to take it on an empty stomach, and uh, you can't eat anything for at least an hour after. So I go ahead and take that, and then I fell back to sleep, and I didn't finally rouse till the dogs were begging me to go outside to go potty. <laughs> and... Uh, Literally, it was nearly 2 o'clock this afternoon before I was even able to get roused enough to, to get up. I got up, and I realized how late it was. I said, oh, Lord, I've got to go drive. I've got to make money. I've got to pay bills. So I ran out to the car, and I drove down to CBS. I had some... Had some uh, Prescriptions I was needing to pick up at CVS. Ran down to CVS. And I got to tell you, I am too tired to drive. You see me driving right now. I'm actually driving back home. Um, I went to CVS and I said, oh, dear Jesus. I'm, You know, y'all y'all can't tell how I feel. But I mean, honest to God, my eyes are so heavy right now. And I am so wore out. And I thought, dear God, there is no way in the world I can drive today. Um, I don't want to put people in danger, you know, driving for Uber and all. And I don't want to be driving extremely worn out and tired because, um, you know, obviously I can make mistakes. I can wind up having a wreck or something. And I don't want anybody getting hurt. So y'all pray for me because... Um, this is something I go through an awful lot these days, and it's driving me insane. It really drives me crazy. It affects your mood. Uh, it does not just affect, you know, you physically, but it affects your mood. If you've ever been really, really exhausted, I mean, to the point, you know, you honestly, you just feel like you can fall asleep driving or doing whatever you're doing, and that's how I feel right now. If you've ever been like that, then you understand that you kind of get crabby and, you know, stuff like that, and that's what happens to me. That's why I said yesterday in my message that, uh, 
Sometimes I come home and poor Tommy, I'm just raging, you know. I'm so crabby and grumpy and, and you know, upset and uptight. And uh, normally, if I'm blessed, I'm able to drive about uh, four hours before I'm at this point. But unfortunately, today I got out and uh, it's, let me see. It's three o'clock our time, so it hadn't even been an hour, and I'm, I'm just so, so, so tired. I can't see straight, and so I need y'all to really pray for me. Um, the doctors are trying to figure out what's causing all this fatigue. I uh, was experiencing this in a really bad way. I mean, it was worse than it is now. When I first started on the treatment for the leukemia, the first uh, chemo drug they had me on, literally all I could do was sleep. That's all I could do. I could not function at all. Um, I literally just slept the entire day. And when Tommy would come home from work, he would wake me up and he'd give me something to eat and then I'd fall right back to sleep. That's all I could do all day without, you know. And then on Sunday, I would push myself to be able to get up and preach and have church. And then I would push and push and push to try to get the video out. And I would be falling asleep between, uh, you know, I mentioned that when I first uh, edit the video, I have to uh, uh, publish it to our computer. Well, while it would be publishing to the computer, I'd have to wait on it, you know, and I would just fall asleep. Then I'd wake up hours later, and I would go ahead and, and uh, try to finish uh, uploading it to YouTube. Then I'd have to wait for it to do its thing on YouTube, and then I'd fall asleep again. And then I, when I'd wake up for a minute, I'd immediately try to download it from YouTube, and so I could go ahead and put it on the other channel. I mean, literally, it was just, it was terrible because I would sleep between each and every step of the process and it would take me, you know, eight or nine hours. A lot of times, if you look back several months, there were many times I didn't get the Sunday message up and available until the next morning. Whereas normally, I try to get it up as quickly as I can. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I believe in the message that we preach. And I believe the ministry we have in the LGBT community <clears throat> is so important. Um, I've, I've been around some other LGBT so-called Pentecostals, okay? And um, I've been contacted by dozens of people over the last 25 years that I've been in affirming ministry. And I've heard a lot of horror stories. I've heard a lot of things that really honestly make my stomach turn. People contacting uh, an LGBT affirming minister or church trying to reconcile their faith with who they are as an LGBT person only to have that preacher uh, you know try to get them into bed I don't know how, what other way to say it and uh, I mean I've heard some really terrible stories from a number of people I've had some people call me and tell me that not only did the preacher they contacted try to get them into bed, but they were trying to convince them to have a threesome with them and their partner, the preacher and his partner. This kind of foolishness is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. It's not godly morality, number one. It is not keeping with ministerial integrity, number two. It is not treating the flock of God as the flock of God. They're not your sexual playthings. They are God's people. 
<clears throat> when people come to you for help with spiritual matters, they're not coming to you for a date, they're not coming to you for sexual exploits, they're coming to you for spiritual help. And your only obligation to them, your only obligation to them is spiritual. And if you step outside of those boundaries, uh, you deserve to get yourself beat down is what you deserve, if you want me to be truthful about it. But anyway, I, you know, I've heard all kinds of stories. I've been to conferences conducted by various people, and I'm going to tell you, I couldn't believe what I felt. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was, it was not good. And the ministry that we have is so important, I believe, to our cause as a movement and to our people, to our community. Uh, and as I said yesterday, you know, it's not just about LGBT people. Believe me, there are many, many, many non-LGBT people out there who are victims of spiritual abuse and, uh, you know, victims of the condemnation and the guilt mongering and all that that goes on in the church today. And they really benefit from our message and from our ministry. And this is why our message is so important. And I spend the energy and I spend the time and I work as hard as I do to get our message out. I'm not trying to be a celebrity and thank God I'm not because that isn't happening. I'm certainly not trying to be rich and thank God for that because I guarantee you that's not happening. It has nothing to do, it has to do with the message. It has to do with the message. We've got to get this message out. There are so many people in our world. There are so many people in our community. There are so many that are LGBT and non-LGBT who desperately need to hear what this ministry is saying. And that's why I devote the level of energy. And, and you know, I, I had a customer one time ask me. He said, you know, he considered himself an agnostic. And he said, how in the world do you, why do you do what you do? Because I mentioned something to him, I think, about pastoring a small church here in Dallas. I said, but it doesn't pay me, so I work Uber to try to pay my bills. And he said something to me to the effect, well, why would you do that? You know, why would you work at something and not be paid for it and then turn around and have to work a job on top of that to try to just so you can do the other job, you know? And I told him, I said, it's because God called me. When I was eight years old, God called me to the ministry. And when you have a calling, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Uh, I don't have time for professional preachers. I don't have time for these twits running around preaching so they can make money. And I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to say it just as plain as I can say it. There are a lot of people, a lot of people in our world, especially in certain minority communities and, and God forgive me somebody's going to get mad at me I don't care you go into certain minority churches and every Tom, Dick and Harry in the church calls himself a preacher and they do this because that way preaching becomes a little side job for them you know it becomes a little um part-time job they can go back to and make a few bucks here and there. And uh, that's, that's not my situation. God called me to preach. I, honestly, if I had a choice, I wouldn't even do it. Not for a million dollars. You couldn't pay me enough money to do what I do. 
but God called me. And I'm going to tell you, that calling is so real. Every time I think about the experience of the Lord calling me, every time I think about the confirmations that I've received, I just pulled up in front of my house. So you'll see me stopping and looking at the camera. I don't want anybody to crab that I'm, you know, looking at the camera. I've actually had people, you shouldn't do videos while you're driving. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, some people can't chew gum and walk at the same time, but I can. If I'm driving, I'm paying attention to the road. I may glance at the camera once in a while, but if I had a, somebody sitting in the car beside me, I'd be doing the same exact thing. Uh, but I'm still paying attention to the road. But anyway, you know, when I think about God calling me and, and the experience I had when the Lord called me to preach, when I think about the um, confirmation of that calling that I received from uh, Dr. C.M. Ward, one of the greatest men in the uh, Pentecostal movement uh, of his time, one of the greatest men in the Assemblies of God denomination. And that man shook my hand and looked down at me at 12 years old. And as if I had told him exactly what I'd been praying and asking God, I, I'd been praying and asking God because I felt so inadequate and so, you know, I didn't grow up in an ivory tower. I didn't grow up with uh, godly parents and, you know, all this wonderful stuff like so many other preachers. And I couldn't believe that God really called me. I began to really question if the Lord had called me to preach. And I was praying and asking God if he really did call me, if he would speak through someone that I really admired and really appreciated who was in ministry. I said, Lord, just speak to them and tell them to tell me that you have, in fact, called me to preach. Well, honestly, I loved my pastor. I loved Brother Barlow. Coleman Barlow was my pastor. And I loved that man. I admired him. He was a marvelous man of God and a wonderful preacher. And I was waiting for Brother Barlow to be the one to tell me. I don't know why. You know how sometimes you're praying and asking God for something and you have all these self-expectations. You know, you you think you figure out how the Lord's going to answer your prayer, what he's going to do, how he's going to do it. Well, Brother Barlow never did. But our church invited Dr. C.M. Ward one of the greatest men of God in the, in the 1980s. This was back in the 1980s. Uh, Earl, well, actually, I'm trying to remember. No, it might have been the late 70s. But anyway, back in the day when PTO Club was real big on TV, Jim and Tammy Baker, you know. And Dr. Ward used to be on PTO once in a while. And you just, oh, I'm going to tell you, if you ever get a chance, uh, go online, go on YouTube and stuff and, and uh put in Dr. C.M. Ward and listen to some of his old messages. He was a wonderful, wonderful preacher. And the way he would say things was so beautiful. I used to love to listen to him. And I admired him so much. And the long story short, he came to preach at our church and <clears throat> we had to rent out a huge auditorium because he drew such a crowd. There was no way in the world, our little church that I grew up in, we only could hold about probably, oh, 250, 300 at best in our sanctuary. We rented out a school auditorium that would hold thousands. And he filled it up. I mean, he filled it up full. And uh, after the service was over, I'm not going to go into all the gory details because take all day and all night. But after the service, I had the opportunity at the, at the very end of everything uh, I ran down to the pastor's car. He was opening the door to let Brother uh, Ward in, and he was going to drive him to the airport. And I ran down to the car, and I got mm -hmm. to shake Brother Ward's hand. And Dr. C.M. Ward, here he was, an old, wise mm -hmm. man of God, 
Oh my God, that man was so full of the Holy Ghost, you could feel it dripping from him. And I was a 12 year old kid. And I shook his hand. And when I did, he put his mm -hmm. left hand mm -hmm. over my hand mm -hmm. that was in his hand, over his right hand and my little hand in his hand. And he looked at me and I'll never forget his words if I live to be a thousand. And he looked at me and he said, young man, mm -hmm. the Holy mm -hmm. Ghost mm -hmm. has informed me to tell you that God has called you to the ministry. I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I couldn't believe who I was hearing it from. One of the greatest men in the denomination that I grew up in, one of the greatest men in the Pentecostal movement, internationally acclaimed, world known. And he's looking at this 12 year old boy as if he heard me say to God, God, please tell somebody to tell me that you've called me to the ministry. But to, ju don't just tell anybody, tell somebody that I admire and somebody that when they say it to me, I'm going to take it to heart. I had, <laughs> I had no idea in the world the Lord would use Dr. Sia Moore. That, that was the furthest thing from my mind. So I share all that to say this. This is why I do what I do, folks. When God calls you, I'm going to tell you, I, I can't even explain it, it uh, you know. When God calls you to the work of the ministry, you feel like you've got to do the work that he's called you to do because if you don't, you're going to drop dead on the ground. And I don't mean that in the way of, you know, the Lord's going to punish you. That's not what I'm talking about. But I mean, it's when God's called you, that work that he's called you to do, that ministry that he's given you to do, it pulses through your veins. It It is your lifeblood. It becomes your sole motivation in life. One of the greatest men of God I ever knew in my life and one of my greatest mentors in ministry is the pastor <clears throat> that I came to know when I moved to Texas back in 1982 at 16 years old when the Holy Ghost spoke to me to come to Texas. I had the opportunity to, I began to attend the church that my great aunt had been attending for many decades, and the pastor was an incredible, wonderful, oh my goodness, marvelous man of God. Brother J.T. Gillum was his name. And he pastored the Riverside Church of God in Fort Worth, Texas. And Brother Gillum was old-fashioned Pentecostal. I'm going to tell you, old-time Pentecostal holiness, you know. But there was something different about Brother Gillum than a lot of your old-time Pentecostal holiness uh, preachers. Number one, he did not preach what we refer to as clothesline. In other words, his sermons had a whole lot more going on for him than preaching about how long a woman's dress was and how long her hair was and whether or not women wore makeup and jewelry. Brother Gillum didn't preach all that. He lived it. He and his wife lived it. And the church was holiness. I mean, the people lived in the church as well, for the most part. But Brother Gillum embraced everybody. He loved everybody. If, if you wore makeup, if you cut your hair, if you did all the things that he believed a Christian ought not to do, it did not change for one minute how he and his wife approached you, how they treated you. No. It, it, it didn't matter who in the church, what they looked like or how they dressed or how, you know, I'm going to tell you, he just had such a wisdom about him. And Brother Gillum became one of my greatest mentors in ministry. And uh, I learned so much from him. And he 
Uh, he taught me things that I, to this very day, implement every single day of my life in ministry. And Brother Gillum started the Riverside Church of God. And uh, he was in his, I'm, I want to say, I believe he was in his 30s when he started the church. He had pastored and ministered before that. But he started this particular church. And he retired in the 80s. And I had the opportunity shortly after he retired I started my third church, uh, excuse me, my second church, which was Church of God also. At that time, I was still part of the Church of God denomination. And I had the opportunity uh, to have Brother Gillum come and preach for me in my church. And that was the greatest blessing in the world because I just admired him so much. And, you know, I just couldn't believe that here I was pastoring a little church. We had about 40 people or so. And uh, you got to remember, I started the church. So <laughs> we had 40 people or so, and we weren't even a year old. And uh, Brother Gillum came and he preached for us. You know, we had a wonderful, wonderful time with him. But Brother Gillum died shortly after he retired, not too long after he retired. He was only in his 70s, early 70s, as I recall. And he literally just died. And I knew from my own experience, I said, you know what? His, his ministry was over. His work was over. He was no longer pastoring the church that he had built and he had established and he had poured his life into for many, 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 many decades. I mean, that man dedicated children and those children grew up and got married and they had children and he dedicated their children. He performed their weddings, you know, I mean, literally for uh, generations. He, he was with the same church for about 40 years, I believe, by the time he retired. And I knew when he passed away, I, I just knew, I said, his work was done. He he. He lost, in a sense, he lost his will to live. And, you know, I've told Tommy the same thing. I said, I can't stop doing what I'm doing because if I stop doing what I'm doing, I'll drop dead on the floor. I don't do what I do because it's fun, because it's not. I don't do what I do to make money because I don't make money. I don't do what I do because it makes me a celebrity, because I'm hardly a celebrity. I do what I do because I believe in what I'm doing. I do what I do because I was an LGBT person who was away from God, who felt like God hated him and couldn't stand him and, and the very smell of him disgusted the Lord. And I felt like I had no place in the kingdom of God. I had no place at God's table. I had no place in the church that God despised me because of who I was. And from the first day I came out, the spirit of the Lord kept talking to me and telling me, I understand you, Charles. I get you, Charles. You don't understand. I get it. There is nothing about you. There is nothing about who you are that I don't understand. And I, and, and I remember telling the Lord, you know, years ago, I'd say, Lord, he'd say, you can minister to LGBT people. You, you can do it because of who you are. Because you understand, because you're living the same experience, you can minister to LGBT people. A straight man couldn't do it. And I would tell the Lord, Lord, I can't minister to anybody because I don't believe what you're saying. And I went through like three years out of church. 
And the Spirit of the Lord would wrestle with me, oh my God, during that whole three. I was the most miserable human being on planet Earth for three years. I'm not kidding. Oh, I was the most miserable, unhappy person. I was Jonah in the belly of the whale, honey. I was running from God. It wasn't that the Lord wasn't there for me because he was just like you. (laughs) You think God isn't there for you? I got news for you, baby. He's there for you. If anybody is running, it's not God, it's you. And I was running from the Lord and, I, you know, I was trying to fight him off because he kept telling me and I'd say, Lord, you know, after what happened in the church, after the humiliation and the embarrassment that I went through in this enormous uh, mega apostolic mm-hmm. Pentecostal church in Texas back in the late 80s. I said, Lord, there is no way in the world I'll ever try to step back into ministry. There is no way in the world. And I was so miserable. My God, was I miserable because God called me to preach. I don't care what kind of job I tried to take. I don't care how I tried to make a living. Uh, I mean, I would do well and I'd make money. I sold cars for a long time and I was very good at selling automobiles and I made extremely good money during that period of time. Uh, when I first came out in 1989, you know, and uh, I come out effectively, literally on Mother's Day 1989. That was my, honest to God, that was like my official coming out day. That was the day I'd made up my mind and said, okay, I'm going to be honest with myself. I'm sick and tired. I'm, I'm sick and tired of being lonely. I'm sick and tired of being miserable. I'm sick and tired of trying to make everybody else happy. I'm sick and tired of uh, trying to live up to expectations. And I'm sick and tired of, I, I, I just can't do it. I said, I've got to be honest with myself. I, I just have to. I can't take this anymore. And on Mother's Day, 1989, I went to my first gay bar or gay club, nightclub, I guess, in New Haven, Connecticut. For those of you that may remember the old Copacabana in, in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, in in Mother's Day, 1989, I came back from Texas. I uh, made up my mind I was going to come out and be honest with myself and quit playing games with me and God. And, you know, uh, I was not doing anything in the closet. That's one reason I hate the term in the closet, because it implies that you're doing something in secret that you wouldn't do openly, you know. And that was not the case for me. I wasn't doing anything in the closet. I was simply being miserable and unhappy and depressed and suicidal and, you know, for years because inwardly, internally, I knew I was gay, but I just could not face that fact because, you know, I'd been taught all my life that gay people go to hell and God hates them and blah, 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 you know. And uh, so I I could not even admit to myself that I was gay. To be honest, I came out, and a lot of y'all that are LGBT, you'll probably identify with this too. I used to, when I first came out, all I could ever admit to was being bisexual. If somebody asked me, I'd say, well, I'm bisexual. Because... To say you were gay, that meant you were fully invested. You know, that meant you were fully owning it, you know. But saying you were bisexual, well, that kind of kind of kept you on the teeter-totter of halfway being right and halfway being wrong, you know. And that's, that's what I did for the first couple of years after I came out. Uh, I don't know. It's funny what us folks go through, you know. But the Lord was constantly talking to me when I first came out. I went the very first night I went into a gay nightclub on, on Mother's Day, 1989, New Haven, Connecticut, the Copacabana, which sadly isn't there anymore. It was a kind of a neat place. I used to, I used to love that place. And, uh, I went in there and I was scared out of my mind. I mean, honey, I was spooked out of my mind. 
I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was going to see. I didn't know how people were going to act. All I could imagine was, you know, a bunch of sexual perverts all feeling all over one another. And, you know, and it was so funny because all the idiotic, crazy ideas that I had been taught about gay people, I believed. Every one of them, I believed all that stuff about gay people. Oh, they're just pigs and perverts. And, you know, those gay clubs are full of men just feeling all over one another and having sex in corners and blah, blah, blah. Well, I go into this club. And, of course, there's men, there's women. And, of course, you know, uh, my understanding of, of gay women, well, they were just a bunch of bulldog dykes, you know, who wore uh, big old baggy jeans and flannel shirts and, you know, looked like men and, you know, hated men. Oh, they hated men. This is all the garbage that I literally believed when I came out. And I go into this club and there were some gorgeous women in that, I mean, beautiful girls in that club. And I remember thinking, what in the world are they doing here? And, of course, I thought all gay men were muscled and worked out and, you know, um, were, you know, bodybuilders and, you know, handsome and all. Because, after all, being gay is only about lust. That's all it is. It's just about lust. So if it's about lust, then then... It has to be men who are just really gorgeous and who are really, you know, body conscious and all that. And, of course, I, I wasn't that, but I figured I was the exception to the rule. And I go in there and there's big old fat chubby fellas like me. There's older people. There's younger people. They, you know, there, there was such a variety of people. It wasn't even funny. I found out in short order that... Uh, some of the most beautiful women on this planet were lesbian and shocked the fire out of me because they didn't look anything like what I thought a lesbian was supposed to look like. I found out that gay men came in all shapes and sizes. I met couples who had been together 30 years, 40 years, 25 years. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, my understanding of, 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 Gay men, you know, they're not interested in love and they're not interested in relationships and they're not interested in all this. Uh, how, how is it these come? And I literally, for years after I came out, I could not believe what I was seeing with my own eyes. I literally, folks, had been so programmed to believe all the garbage that I could not get it through my head. And I would say a lot of times, I would say some of these um, stereotypical things, you know. And I remember saying it in front of some older men who had been together for a long time. So, and I remember them saying, well, I hate when I hate when people say that, man, that irritates me when I hear something. And now I fully understand what they, what they were saying because I feel the same exact way. But it took me years to get all that stupidity, all that garbage that had been driven into my head. It took me years to get all that mess out. And during the first uh, three years, I was out of church about about three years or so, a little over. Um, the Lord kept speaking to me. He said, Charles, you could minister to LGBT people. You could help them understand that God's grace, my grace is sufficient for them. You could help them understand that I love them as much today, who glory, as I ever loved them. And there isn't a thing in the world they can do. There isn't a place in the world they can go. There isn't a thing on this planet that will ever separate them from my love and they could still have a place in the church they still could have a place at the table they still could walk in fellowship with me and you can help these people understand that because you have lived the experience you know what it is to be gay you know what mm -hmm. it is to live a lie you know what it is to fight something that is a part of you that 
By no means did you go out and choose. By no means did you pick it. You understand this, Charles. You can minister to these people. And it literally took three years. And uh, if, if you saw, I'm telling you, God is amazing. The Lord is so amazing. My partner uh, of, of several years back when I first came out, I wound up meeting somebody and we spent a few years together. And at that time, uh, Jason was a few years younger than me, about five years younger than me. And to be honest, he was very immature and he was very uh, uh, naive. Oh, you never met anybody as naive as he could be. If there was a scam to be took, he could be took, he could be taken by a scam. When we lived in New York City, you know, and I mean that poor boy, he'd come home and you know they they somebody scammed him and wound up getting his wallet and so he he constantly was falling for something or another, and or somebody told him he could be a model, you know, all he had to do is pay a thousand dollars for pictures and they can make them a model. Well, he, he did all that, you know, and, uh, I was crazy about him, but he wasn't the brightest bulb on Broadway, if you want to say it that way. But, you know, we went through a little separation and I'm trying to shut up. I know I'm just babbling, but I'm exhausted. Uh, and when I'm exhausted, I tend to babble, but maybe this will help somebody. I don't know. Jason and I went through a separation. It seemed like every year we'd go through a separation for about, you know, usually a couple weeks. Well, this particular time, it lasted a little longer than a couple weeks. It lasted about a month or maybe a month and a half. And when we finally tried to make some effort to get back together, he told me that he had begun to attend a Pentecostal church, a mainstream, straight Pentecostal church in Brooklyn, that he had grown up Roman Catholic. But hearing me lament and talk about how much I loved God and I loved the church and I missed it and, you know, because I, I felt like, you know, there was no way in the world I had any place in it, blah, blah, blah talking about the miracles I'd seen, talking about the miracles God had performed in my own life, talking about how real God was to me. And there were times, Jason could tell you, even when I was, the term we use is backslid, you know, even when I was backslid, even when I was out of church, there were times I'd say to Jason, Jason, I got to go in the room and pray a while. I said, just leave me alone. Don't, don't, I don't care what you hear. If, if it sounds like I'm dying in there, if it sounds like I'm being stabbed to death in there, just leave me alone. And I'd go in my room and I'd shut the door and I'd start to pray even when I was out of church. I, Cause that didn't change the fact God was real to me. And I began to pray and I would fall into the spirit just like I did when I was in church. And I'd begin to pray in the Holy ghost and the Lord would encourage me and he'd lift me up. Well, Jason heard me talk about all this and he had seen me struggling with, you know, my spirituality, you know. And when we were broken up, he began to attend this apostolic Pentecostal church in Brooklyn. Well, he decided he felt the need to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins as I preach to this day. And he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He told me this when we got together to to talk about reconciliation. And he said, now, now we can be together. Now we can be a couple the way we're meant to be a couple because now I feel like I'm on the same page with you. He said, all these years, you know, I've always, I've admired your faith and all that. He said, but I, I just couldn't understand anything you were talking about. Whoops, keep beeping my horn back. He said, because, you know, I said, Lord, um, you've really kind of forced my hand and this isn't fair. I told you after what happened to me in 
1989 that I was not about to go back. To, I wasn't about to try to, uh, you know, get back into ministry and what have you. And I said, now you done brought Jason into the faith. I said, and the only choices I have are I can stay out and potentially drag him down, which I, I couldn't do. I had too much of a, of a knowledge of God to want to do that to him. I said, or I can go back in so that I can be a help to him and an encouragement to him in his walk with God. So I said, oh, well, <laughs> here I go. And I went back. Uh, he and I began to visit some churches. I had no intention, none whatsoever, of going back into ministry. That was one thing I'd pretty much sworn off. I said, no, I'll go to church and, you know, I'll do that. Uh, I'll try to find a church he and I can be halfway comfortable in. Of course, we visited any number of mainstream Pentecostal churches. And you know what happened? Preachers began to, they'd be talking to me and they said, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I'd say, well, yeah, you know, I used to be and all that. And, you know, and they'd say, well, you know, why don't you come preach for us on Sunday? And I thought, Lord have mercy. These people don't know who I am. They don't know my life story. Oh, my God, could that ever blow up a church? If this controversy got, oh, the pastor invited a queer to preach in our church. Of course, he didn't know, and he wasn't doing it knowingly, you know. But still, uh, you know, all, all these thoughts, the enemy come against me with all these thoughts. And I said, oh, dear God, what in the world should I do? And the Lord said, what do you mean, what should you do? When I called you to preach, I told you any door that opened to you, I want you to walk through. Any door that is open to you. You're to walk through. I said, oh, dear Lord. So they invited me to preach. I said, okay, fine, I'll preach. And I began to preach. And the spirit of the Lord would fall. And my God, we had some of the most wonderful services. We began to see miracles. We began to see God healing people. I began to see people receiving the Holy Ghost. It was like I'd never been out of church for five minutes. It was as if I'd never left church. And God began to move. Next thing you know, I was being invited to preach in more churches and more churches. And Jason could tell you the first year that I came back to the Lord and came back into church, here I was trying to find my way to minister to LGBT people. And my time was being consumed with invitations to preach in mainstream uh, apostolic Pentecostal churches, Trinitarian Pentecostal churches, you name it. I was being invited to preach. I was living in New York City. I was invited to preach in Spanish churches. I preached in any number of black churches. I mean, you just name it, honey. I, I was preaching all over the place. There was hardly a weekend that went by that um, I didn't have an invitation to preach somewhere. And the funny thing is, Jason was a very effeminate guy. He he was a very, I, I always tease and say he was about one step away from uh, wearing a tutu and carrying a purse, you know. And uh, and he went with me everywhere and, you know, and he was part of every, and nobody seemed to notice or nobody seemed to care. Nobody seemed to, you know. Say, all right, Pastor Charles, you need to shut up real quick because you're boring us to death. Why are you saying all this? Well, I'll tell you why I'm saying all this, folks. I could easily, easily, easily have stayed in a closet of sorts and had the opportunity to preach in some of the biggest churches, in some of the greatest churches, I could be preaching every weekend in a church somewhere and experiencing a marvelous move of God because the Lord proved to me that my ministry was still intact, even though I'd left it for a few years. I easily could have done that. I easily could have continued in that vein for years and years and years if I'd have wanted to. 
And every church I went into gave me a love offering. And, and every church I went into, I wasn't expected to do for nothing. I could have easily stayed with that. I didn't. Because my heart was still with the LGBT community. And I knew that the ministry God had for me today was not to just go back and, and do the same things, you know, I'd done before, even though that was wonderful. And I'm going to tell you, I feel so much more fulfilled and I feel so much more reward when I'm able to preach in churches and see God move and see people being healed and people receiving the Holy Ghost and all these wonderful things. When I was pastoring in the mainstream, I used to be invited all the time to preach in other churches. Um, when I was pastoring my very first church, I was 19 years old. My overseer, the man that was over me in the church of God was a black man. He was from Haiti and he pastored a marvelous church with about probably 150 to 200 people in uh, Connecticut where I was living and where I grew up and you know, and uh, Brother Huggins told me one time, I went, <clears throat> he invited me to come out and preach for him one time. And I went out and preached for him and the spirit of the Lord fell. My God, did it fall. Holy Moses. Some of my own people had come with us from my church that I was pastoring. And some of my own people came and some of them had been praying for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they got it that night at Brother Huggins' church. And uh, Brother Huggins come to me after I preached for him that night, you know. Uh, that was the same day, I'll never forget it as long as I live, that was the same day that I had officially organized my first church as an official congregation of the Church of God. And it was a very, very big day for me. And we had had a whole day full of services and activities at my church. And we weren't going to have an evening service because we had had a full day of activity. And Brother Huggins said, well, since y'all aren't having a, he had come to be part of our organization services and stuff. And he said, well, since you're not having church tonight, he said, why don't you come preach for me? So I went to Stamford, Connecticut, and I preached for him, and the Spirit of the Lord fell, and some of my people received the Holy Ghost, some of his people received the Holy Ghost. Oh my God, we had a marvelous time. I mean, oh Lord, we were shouting and running the aisles, and it was incredible. And uh, this is back in 1980, oh Lord, it's so hard for me to remember, I was 19. So you're looking at like 84, 85, and... Um, Brother Huggins told me after the service, he said, Brother Morrow, any time you walk through the door of this church, you're preaching. He said, I don't care if you show up and you're uninvited and, and unexpected. He said, if you walk through the door of this church, you're preaching. He said, I have never seen a move of God like I saw tonight in this church. And I looked at him and I honestly, I was surprised. I said, well, brother, I'll tell you what, if I could, if I, and I was kind of teasing you. I said, if I could trade my, my church folks for your church folks, I said, boy, I'd take them in a minute because I thought we had had this incredible, wonderful service because he had very receptive and open, you know, people who really were hungry for a move of God. Now, I had a wonderful group of people. Don't misunderstand me. Our church, we organized my first church from conception through organization was literally like six months. And for our organization service, we had about 50 people or so in attendance in six months. I've been doing LGBT ministry for 26 years. And I cannot get two dozen people together in the same room. So you wonder 
why Pastor Charles sometimes comes across like, like he's a raging bull. You wonder why sometimes Pastor Charles comes across like he's about to have a nervous breakdown. You wonder why Pastor Charles gets frustrated and aggravated. You wonder why I beg and plead for support so we can do what we're trying to do. Um, believe me when I tell you, folks, what I've experienced in the last 26 years has been one day of discouragement after another, after another, after another. I have never walked through a valley so deep. I have never traversed a valley so dark. I have never had to fight every day of my life to stay encouraged enough to keep doing what I'm doing as I'm doing today. And then add to that, the Lord's allowed me, <coughs> as I am now, to be dealing with cancer, to deal with diabetes. It just, it just seems sometimes like, you know, every time I turn my head, there's something else being added, another burden being added. And I'm trying to keep doing what God's called me to do. And I'm going to go back and shut up. I'm going to finish right now. Because this is what God's called me to do. And I told you at the beginning of all this rambling, you know, I'm exhausted. I am utterly, completely, totally exhausted. I can't even stand. I'm looking at myself in the phone right now and I'm looking at the bags under my eyes. And, you know, I've been looking like this now for several months. Um, I, yeah, I'm not used to looking like this. I'm not used to having, you know, all this. You can just see the exhaustion in my face. But I'm exhausted. And uh, I really need you to pray for me. I need the Lord to touch me. I need him to strengthen me. I need him to give me um, one thing that would encourage the flames out of me be if, if people in our community would finally wake up and actually try to support what we're doing. That would thrill me to death. I'll tell you, nothing in this universe would make me happier than not having to try to get out and drive Uber every day uh, just so I can pay bills. You know, Tommy and I have been together 18 years. Uh, ever since the first day I met him, I pay my own bills. If I make a bill, I pay a bill. If I charge something on my credit card, I pay that credit card. I don't expect Tommy to pay it. When I wanted to drive Uber, don't you know the car I had was one year too old for their requirement. So I told Tommy, I said, well, maybe if I go out and buy a minivan so I can drive Uber, you know, uh, I'll make enough money to pay for the van. And of course, you know, uh, my other car was almost paid off. And, and I mean, I was literally six months away from having that car paid off. And I really didn't want to go out and buy another car right then. Um, but anyway, I gave that car to a member of our church and needed a car. He was able to make the last six payments and he had a beautiful Ford uh, Explorer. And all it cost them was six car payments. And uh, I went out and bought this. I didn't use my Explorer as a down payment because I was trying to help somebody in the church that needed a car. And I bought this van and committed myself to payments. And then, you know, a year later, I wind up finding out I'm diabetic and I go through all that mess. Then I turned around and last year I find out I've got leukemia. And I've been going through that mess. And there were months that I wasn't even able to drive. Like I told you, the first treatment they put me on, the, le the leukemia treatment, the chemo, um, all I could do was sleep constantly. I, I, could, I couldn't function. Finally, the doctor said, we got to change your treatment because, uh, you know, it's not our goal to have you unable to function. So they put me on a new drug and thank God I was able to tolerate it much better. And I wasn't, I still would get fatigued much more quickly than usual, but I could function for a good five or six hours and then I would get tired, you know, and, and I'd have to quit doing whatever I was doing. 
Anyway, y'all pray for me, please. And uh, if you're able, we I would so appreciate your support. Um, today, like I said, I just drove home and I'm so exhausted. I was going to drive Uber today. I'm just too bloody tired. I can't do it. I'm so tired right now. And that's why I'm babbling the way I'm babbling, because I'm exhausted. So anyway, I'll shut up and leave you all alone. But listen, I hope something I said in all of this is an encouragement to somebody that's watching. I hope there's something I've said that's been a blessing to you. And uh, I pray for you all. We have a prayer board in our sanctuary that we post prayer requests to. If you have a prayer request, you can send me an email or send me a message on Facebook. And what I do is I print it out and I put it up on the prayer board. And every Sunday before church, I make a point, uh, if not during the week, but I go in every Sunday before church and I pray over the prayer board and I literally read and look at every one of those requests again. And I call out the people's names and I call out the requests and uh, we intercede on behalf of those that send in prayer requests. So if you have a prayer request, feel free to send it in and we'll pray for you and you pray for me, okay? God bless you all in Jesus' name. I hope something I've said has been a blessing. Bye-bye now.